Hey everyone, and welcome to episode one of Death Space Filling the Void. My name is Patrick Jones. I've been a journalist in New York City for 10 years. I've also performed a lot of improv and sketch comedy here in New York City. I've wanted to do something on death for a long time. It's always seemed weird to me how little we talk about it. And my hope is to use this podcast as a way for us to have those conversations. I'm curious about how other people look at death, deal with death, deal with grief, and how it changes their lives. In this first episode, it was important to me to get across what I'm looking to do with this podcast, who I am, and give you a little bit of the behind the scenes. I interviewed my girlfriend, Jamie Valancourt, who I live with in Brooklyn here with our dog, Ollie, and our tortoise, Franklin. But first, I wanted to let you know that this episode is brought to you by My Software Tutor. Are your Excel skills optimized for your current job? Do you know the basics but would like to learn more? My Software Tutor offers three levels of real-time Zoom-based courses with a live instructor. They all deliver practical, functional business skills in a friendly, supportive environment. These courses will increase your marketability, whether you're an employee, job seeker, consultant, or contractor. Register at mysoftwaretutor.com and use the promo code POD20 to save 20% off all registrations. And then there's Garnish Entertainment. Are you missing your friends? Tired of unwinding in front of the TV? Losing your marbles ever so slightly? Shake up your night with a Garnished virtual cocktail event. Garnish Entertainment is a New York City-based mixology event company with the mission of bringing communities together through creative and entertaining virtual cocktail classes. Whether you're catching up with old friends, team building with colleagues, or looking for the perfect date night, Garnish would love to be your host. Let's Garnish! Before we jump into the episode, I just want to say if you like the show, please rate and review it. And also be sure to follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. On social, I'm going to be posting quotes and how they've affected me and and how I've looked at them. And so I'm curious to see your reaction to them as well. I'd also like to mention I have another podcast called That Gives Me Anxiety. It's a show about the things that scare us and why they may not be so scary after all. During quarantine, I, I needed something to help my mind escape the fact that we were living in such a tense time and and stuck in the confines of of our own home. And so a lot of work and and time and consideration went into this. And so I am so excited to be sharing it. And and I just want to thank you for your time. All right. Enjoy. Joining me now is the lovely Jamie Valancourt. Jamie is my girlfriend and the love of my life. Yeah, I'm so excited to talk to you on here. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. It feels a little weird because at this point, we've been stuck in quarantine for 10 months. And, and a part of me is like, we've built up so many inside jokes and, and we've like changed how we speak without any other outside interference. So like, are we going to sound crazy in yeah. this? We've talked about how if people heard us, they would be like, what is wrong with this couple? They yeah. I think it's just a, a coping mechanism for oh, yeah. us to laugh about circumstances and not be too stressed out about all of the things there are in the world to be is there, stressed is there out about. Lot, is there a lot of things to be stressed about? <laughs> There's just a few, yeah. yeah, that we've both been and expressed to each other that we feel pretty stressed about. Had some had some raw emotion between the two of us, of course. But yeah, we just try to be silly to one pass the time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> all the time that we have with each other, right, in a one bedroom apartment in Brooklyn. Yep, <laughs> which we've been in this whole time. This whole time, that's right. Uh, this episode is is. It's pretty interesting to me because I've already done 14 episodes of Death Space recorded and came back and am now recording the, the first one and recording the introduction, having the information in my mind everywhere I've kind of taken this. Yeah. Because I've recorded most of this in a one-bedroom apartment, I'm interested to, to get your kind of outside but still inside perspective of, of my like how 
things have looked. Well, we've we've talked about them a lot. You've talked to me about some of your episodes and some of the things that you're interested in in regards to death and dying and why you're doing the podcast. I haven't heard the episodes, mm-hmm. so I don't actually... I, I won't listen to them until they're all together and polished and ready mm-hmm. for the public. Getting all the likes and ums out of there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been kind of wild to have you in the other room recording podcasts while I'm trying to have meetings, which I've <laughs> had in the bathroom in some cases to, <laughs> try yes. to avoid picking up any sound. That is very much appreciated. Like there were times that I didn't even know that you were doing that. And then you'd come out of the bathroom being like, yeah, I just took uh, my 130 from the bathroom. Yeah. But they're really, I mean, it's it, it's very much appreciated and, and I feel very supported. You've been pretty passionate about this and excited to, to get it going. So yeah, it's honestly something I've wanted to do for a very long time. Mm-hmm. I think it's something that so many people struggle to talk about. I, I'm curious why you think people are so afraid to discuss death. I think it makes people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I think that in America, we don't really like to acknowledge that our mortality, really. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of taboo to discuss it in some ways. Like it's a downer. Mm -hmm. And, And people, I don't think we create enough spaces where people feel open enough to cry or be vulnerable or express how they're truly feeling. We have a lot of these on the surface conversations Mm -hmm. with people, especially with our co-workers and sometimes with friends that there are things underneath that we want to talk about, but they're not widely accepted as something that we talk about and and different cultures handle that differently Yeah, uh, and handle it much better. Yeah, right. The average coworker conversation is like sports, weather. Right. I'm good. Are you good? Yeah, yeah. great. Good. And if you good say something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. I think uh, I remember there was a man who was seated next to me at work where every week, probably maybe more than more than that, Someone would come over to talk to him about whatever and would look at a picture of his family. They would come up to him and say, well, is that your daughter? Better get a shotgun. Or, you know, I hope you got a big backyard because the guys, here they come. And it was just like, oh my gosh, how many people could have the same conversation and also like... It's common one-liners. Yeah. It's just, it's what people say. Right. I think we have some trouble with being authentic with people a lot of times just and it's not always because people don't want to be open or have those types of conversations i think we're pressed for time also and Mm -hmm. we only have so much energy or like emotional space to share with people so we put up a little bit of barriers or try to make common lighthearted jokes that Hopefully you can have a nice exchange. Everybody just wants to have a nice experience. Like we're having a good time, right? You and I. Right. Yes. We're doing. We're doing good things. Yeah. Well, going back to like American culture too, it feels just like you know, pass the Bud Lights. Here we go. Like it's just a party. You know, don't bring us down. Yeah. And I'm certainly guilty of that, where someone has brought up something that's made me uncomfortable, and I've just tried to, uh, God, it's yeah. or like you can walk away or, or just try to steer the conversation somewhere. Yeah. Easier. You're harsh in my mellow, man. You're killing my buzz. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. I don't want to talk about all this deep stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they're not necessarily conversations to be had with everyone, but mm-hmm. because they are deeply personal when it comes to to people that you've lost in your life, but they also shape you so much, too. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And at times, in recording this, I got a lot of insight, and... By, by no means is this a overall, this is the way to approach death. But like the overarching thing or, or sentiment is that a lot of people express that people say to them when they lose someone uh, that they don't know what to say. And, and what I've picked up is that just say that. Say, I, I'm so sorry and I'm here for you. 
really just expressing that you're there in their orbit Mm -hmm. looking after them means a lot yeah i like what uh Brene Brown says that the most powerful two words in the English language are me too. Mm. So sharing a similar experience or even in in some cases, not even even doing that much, but just acknowledging like, Mm -hmm. hey, if you ever want to talk, I'm here for you. I want to grab a lunch or... And yeah, I mean, me too is is very powerful in that, I mean, not not just death, like anxiety or or really anything. Mm -hmm. You may think that like, oh my God, I'm I'm a crazy person. Why am I feeling this way? And then you hear about it, uh, something similar, a friend of a friend or something like that. And you just feel more grounded, I think. Mm -hmm. You feel seen. Yeah. 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 Not that you're rooting for other people to be going through your pain, but that pain is kind of the human experience to it certain extent unfortunately pain joy all of that just connecting with people making them feel like you you've shared an experience that makes you feel more connected to them right you're part of the human tapestry Mm -hmm. well you took a class on what was it death and dying yeah it was actually called death and dying really 101 was there like a number to it (laughs) i don't think so i think it was just a single class yeah (laughs) It was a a time in my life that I was very much open to exploring different things and... I don't think you're you're closed off. I mean, you may have just phrased that as a... You you were really trying to explore. Just especially in that time. At that time in my life, I was not so much interested in following the crowd or doing things that other generations expected of me. Mm -hmm. I was very much interested in making my own mistakes. I was open to other people's opinions, but kind of like the dude, you know, that's just like your opinion, man. (laughs) That's my (laughs) attitude. That's my philosophy. And, uh, (laughs) And I saw the opportunity to take this death and dying class and it's I had also not recently but lost the closest person to me that I had ever lost before my grandfather Mm -hmm. I hadn't lost someone that close to me before and I was still going through that I mean it was years later but I I was grappling with a lot of the reality of our lives being finite Mm -hmm. and that while other people knew him and could tell me stories about him or tell me what his perspective might be, I realized that I will never actually, as an adult, be able to have a conversation with my grandfather and find out how he felt about certain things, find out his, his thoughts. And that was, that was a, a, a tough thing for me to, to grapple with. Well, it's something you still grapple with. I feel like your grandfather has been someone you've been trying to reconnect with. I mean, you talked to your grandmother, Barbara, about him. I, you know, I've heard you talk to your mom about him recently. And, and, and yeah, so that must have been, it clearly made an impact on, on, on you. So I'm curious, uh, tell us a little bit more about your grandpa. I mean... From what I know, you, you typically describe him as a bit of a, a Marlboro man. He had horses, but I'll let you. Yeah, he he uh, he was the kind of cowboy, quintessential Marlboro man. Like, <laughs> he was a cowboy. He had those. He liked those plaid shirts with the buttons that like break away. Sure, not like the hipsters have. No. Like <laughs> he. Wore a cowboy hat, had a big belt buckle, plaid shirts, cowboy boots. He raised horses on his land. And my grandmother would tell us stories about how they had a little farm and stuff. And uh, some Thanksgivings, everything on the table, they grew or raised themselves, which I thought was pretty incredible. Yeah, there's so much pride in that. Yeah. Absolutely. And he just loved the heck out of me, took really good care of me, just made me feel like I was special. Mm. And that was 
important to me. Uh, especially looking back and having lost him, he was, I believe, 62 when he died of, of lung cancer. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was a teenager and still pretty... I was grown up enough, but I was also still pretty mixed up about life and everything. And it, when he died, I was pretty numb to mm. it. Uh, I didn't cry a whole lot. I mean, I was sad. I remember going to his funeral and walking up to the open casket and feeling like that looked nothing like my mm. grandfather. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't until much later, uh, and I remember driving down the road I think I was coming from work and I was on my way home that something just popped into my head, a a question that I wanted to ask him and I realized I never would be able to. Um, And I had to pull over on the side of the road. It still makes me cry to talk about um, because it was just so striking to me in that moment. I hadn't sort of considered that I would never be able to talk to him as an adult Mm -hmm. because that's very different right as a you know as a grandchild it's it's more like here i found a dollar for you and and fun things like that yeah taking me for ice cream or to horse trails i mean all those wonderful memories that i have of you know spending time with him as a kid um there are just so many there's so many more things to you know, the complexities of family and things that happen that I realized I'll, I'll never know what he thought about those things. Mm-hmm. And it made, it made me like, <laughs> it made me cry to the point that I was like hysterical and I had to pull over oh, man. Um, on the side of the road and just let it out. Well, it's, it's interesting to think about or, I don't know if interesting is the right word, that it just grips you, that that grief can grip you at any moment and just kind of wash over you. Well, there there are so many layers to it, you know. It it takes a while for things to to sink in, Mm -hmm. especially when they're they're that complex. And you're that young. I mean, in your late teens, you may not even understand what you're experiencing. Yeah. I, I felt I felt very numb and I remember at his funeral feeling like like they 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 made it all very happy and positive which I guess is what you're you should do at a funeral but there are you know my grandpa was a tough man he mm-hmm. was a difficult man and when he got angry he scared the living crap out of me like he was he was tough and I I you know I loved him for those things too they're just I th- I had a hard time at his funeral because they were, I felt like they were talking about someone else. Like they weren't talking about the complete person, just sort yeah. of like, oh, what a fun poker player, as opposed was, to like he had. It was yeah, there's issues. All the positive stories, yeah. yeah. And it just, um, I just remember thinking that they weren't being honest about who he was. And again, he wasn't a bad man. He was a he was a very good man. He was a tough man, but it. It just opened my eyes to a lot of the the ways in which we we handle death, and I it's not always the most healthy. Hmm. Why? What? What makes you say that? What? What is something that you would say isn't healthy? Well, we don't we don't talk about it enough. We don't open up and create, like I said, create these spaces where we can discuss it and be honest about who people were and you know mm-hmm. nobody's perfect people make mistakes and I, I guess uh, it's okay to to acknowledge those things yeah because it wasn't like I loved him despite his faults I loved him for everything that he was mm-hmm. um, and that's the way he loved me too you know like right I don't know the the idea that, you know, people are imperfect. Mm-hmm. And that's so okay. Yeah. So okay. In fact, it's uh, 
you know, a person's probably boring if, if they don't have something. Right? Yeah, a little edge to them, a little, you know, dark. A little vice, you're right. <laughs> well, it, and it's like one of those things where if you don't see it, you should almost be really scared because the person <laughs> is then like sweeping it under the shed, so to speak. Yeah. And that's terrifying. But yeah, I, I think that is very real. There's that saying, don't speak ill of the dead. And I, I like that sentiment. Sort of if a person had wronged you and, and it's out and, and that person passes to sort of let it go and try to look on the bright side. But I don't think that's the same thing as being honest about like exactly what you're describing, being honest about who that person was and appreciating their faults. Yeah. My favorite animator, Miyazaki, has a quote, and I'm, I hope I don't butcher it, but it's something like, acknowledge the good and the evil in life. Pledge yourself to neither side, but instead promise to preserve the balance between the two mm. and i i just find that quote so honest and and real that we can't shut out the evil or the bad in this world and there's there's a place for it there's a balance to life and it and people talk about that all the time but i think more often than not we try to shut out the bad that's not healthy either. Mm -hmm. Don't ignore that it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you were when you were going through that, I'm curious what was surprising about grief, or what would you say helps you deal with grief in, into the future? I think that it helped me ground myself in my own mortality. That I. I'm not going to live forever and what are the things that are most important to me that I want to make sure and preserve in my life honesty is a huge uh, value that I hold and that I, I want to maintain love acknowledgement of you know good and bad and unconditional love um, is so important when I watch movies on serial killers or something like that. I always find myself sort of sympathetic to the the killer. What? <laughs> I always think to myself, we are not born in this life evil. Mm -hmm. It's I'm you know there there's a balance of course this world is kind of good and evil, but I think there's definitely more of a nurturing of evil well like jason Voorhees was ridiculed and tortured as a young boy before he drowned in the lake it's that sort of thing i always question what has driven this person to do these things mm -hmm. and it's part of why i'm very much against the death penalty because i feel like people there's so much to learn from people who commit evil acts Mm -hmm. And we need to study that and try to reform people and let them know that they're not inherently bad. Bad things happen to them. Mm -hmm. So it made me, it just gave me a, a different perspective on life. And then also to make sure that I say the things that I feel are really important to be said. And ask the questions. Right. And... I guess there are two ways that it could go if we acknowledge our mortality more often. Either we'll look at the world as more precious and our relationships important and find the values in our lives, or we'll think, well, I've only got this, this one life, I should just get whatever I can out of it. And, loot and pillage and what, whatever I need to do to succeed I can step on people <laughs> who cares mm -hmm. I've got this one life right and it's all I've got I want to be comfortable and, and rich and well I think there's also a an aspect of trying to live forever with that mentality it's like I want to be remembered as the person who had all this stuff and did all these things right you know and that you're kind of 
working your way towards some form of immortality. Right. Uh, which can be a good thing, right? Like people could be remembered for some sci- scientific discovery or, you know, the person who built a bunch of slums <laughs> and... <laughs> Do you have anybody in particular? No, in mind? no, no one in particular. <laughs> I didn't want to lead that in any way. No, but it, it, it's a, it's important um, to have a moral compass. And that's part of this podcast where it, where it's like, I really want it to be as diverse a following or or a discussion as possible because one goal is to give people tools no matter who they are you may be religious and you may connect with someone who's not religious on on something that helps you or or vice versa right and so it's it's very interesting and a tad overwhelming at times to think a lot about a podcast that is related to mortality I, i find it to be a bit heavy i'm genuinely curious about it and i'm genuinely curious about people and to me this is like the ultimate subject matter when it comes to humanity it is heavy it is certainly heavy and it does weigh on me yeah but it's it can also be light it can also be freeing in a lot of ways yeah and there it opens up to so many other subjects it's threaded through so much of our world. It's it's threaded through our entire existence. I, I feel like almost every decision we make, right? Like, I feel like when I was younger and the decision would be like, should you go out on Thursday? And it's like, well, one day I'm going to be not here. So, you know, and that's a little bit of an excuse to just to like binge drink. But <laughs> deep in there it's is... The last night. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Just like every Pitbull song. Yeah, this is it. You better be on the dance floor. Tomorrow's ending. Let's dance like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> right. But yeah, and when we were talking about that, that's why we created the visuals for the podcast the way that we did. Mm-hmm. So you know, love it or hate it, I designed the podcast creative. <laughs> And we talked about all of the cliches of death and dying. We talked about a tombstone and pushing daisies and all of the earthly things. But we ended up designing it more and calling it death space because it really is related to our whole universe, like everything. You know, we look up at the stars and we say that, like, you know, those are people who have come before us or, you know... But we're all connected. Mufasa talking to Simba. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we're, we're all connected in this life. And, and for me, that is religion. That's, yeah. That's the common, that is the higher power, is that we're all in it together. Mm-hmm. You know, we're all made of the same stuff. We're all made of molecules. And we're all temporary. Yeah. And we have to make and peace with that. And we're all forever. We're all infinite. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. It's very true. So tell me a little bit more about this class. Were you, I mean, the way you made it sound is that you were searching for something to help explain the feelings regarding your grandfather. Is that accurate? Or was it more you were just open and young and, and, and in college and, and were like, yeah, let me try that. It was more of a general curiosity okay. in what this class would be about, what topics we'd cover, how different cultures handle death or talk about dying or the soul. And mm-hmm. yeah, we, we covered all of those things. It was, an, it was nice to have a space where that was the subject. You mm-hmm. knew every time you went to that class that that was what we were going to be talking about. And what do you do before you walk in? Do you just like take a breath? I mean, do you have like a, a snack with you? Like a little extra sugar in your coffee that morning? It's a, it, it's just like any other class. I mean, you, you schedule time for it and prepare for it the same way okay. you would. It, it just was normal, but then you get in there and 
that's the subject. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there was some sort of like emotional preparedness that you found that you needed to bring to that. No, it was, I found it to be really nice to just have a space where we talked about suicide and Mm -hmm. we talked about what we would want to say to people if we died tomorrow. Mm. And I wrote a letter to my family uh, wow. during that class. And Does that get graded? Out a lot of feelings. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I didn't I mean, it was pretty tough to fail that class. <laughs> yeah. That's true. As long as you're open and honest, I would expect that you would Yeah, as long as you're willing to write things out and I had to visit a cemetery. Mm-hmm. Um, for that class just spend time in a cemetery which I had never done before and I found it really peaceful and enjoyable Mm -hmm. and I walked around and read the tombstones of people who had died and some of them were babies and some of them were kids and some were and you wonder who they were what they were afraid of yeah yeah Yeah. cemeteries are certainly interesting in that in that regard where you, you start to picture who who the person was and and what they hated what they love Mm -hmm. what made them happy i actually like set up a little blanket and had some food out there and Hmm. i minored in photography in college so i took a lot of pictures which Mm -hmm. i still have with a lot of vivid memories from that day because it 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 makes things feel more immediate like Mm -hmm. it just it it sort of forces you into the present yeah and to think about people who have come before you and sort of reassess your life and how you're doing what was the teacher like an older man not like a i could see the the individual teaching the class being like kind of zany or to like make up for the subject matter by being like expressly light you know what i mean or he wasn't really he wasn't okay well that's nice and that's like another sort of thing that bothers me about these subjects is like the idea that people need to be hippie or zany or kooky mm-hmm. in order to have these conversations or have run a class like this. It was a very academic yeah. class. Just like anything else. Good. That's good. That's it's actually really nice. That that's kind of before I started recording these episodes, I, I, I wanted to or I thought about like, what my role as like the person interviewing should be. Mm-hmm. And I settled really on I mean, this is I'm part of the I'm going on the journey with the people listening. I want to help put together this catalog of experience and so i i I really settled on i'm not going to try to do anything other than what the person needs right at at times it was just listening there there's episodes of this podcast where i really don't say much and and it's just because the person was on to something and was just unraveling and and in a good way unraveling some sort of discovery and, and I didn't want to get in the way, uh, but really just just not being zany or or anything like that. Just just trying to be a good listener and and genuinely curious. Yeah, I would think that's what a good podcast host would do. He'd ask engaging questions and let the get out of the way. Yeah, let the person you're interviewing just run with it. Absolutely. Uh, well, I'm curious if there's anything you want to talk about related to death or dying or grief? I think that what this podcast is going to do is really what I would hope that we could continue to do, and which is just open up conversations about death and dying and all of the things related to that, which is literally everything. Mm-hmm. I love that you're doing this and I can't wait to hear all the stories from experts and people who have just found ways of connecting with people that have lost someone and I think it's it'll be a really healthy 
experience, especially during a pandemic when hundreds of thousands of people are dying and we're feeling lost and sad and need a place to go to openly discuss these things. Yeah, I, I'm very excited to finally share this with people. And, and on top of experts and, and people who figured things out, I also want to talk to people who don't have it figured out. Like going back to what we we're talking about, but about feeling seen. A lot of people can connect with the person who is currently struggling. I just hope that this connects with people because I've really enjoyed doing it. And, and you know, a lot of this first, se- first two seasons is people I know. And I, I really want to keep pushing to people I don't know. Mm-hmm. And because my circle is, is limited. I, anyone's circle is limited. And so I, I really want to keep pushing it forward and, and learn as much as I can. Yeah, and for some people, it's really hard to get to that place where you can open up mm-hmm. and discuss yes. your feelings and your pain. And um, hopefully this will be a place that they can come and listen to other people open up about death and dying and think about it in a new and interesting way and maybe that'll encourage them to open up and be vulnerable absolutely well thank you so much for being open and and honest and sharing a little bit of your experience with us here and uh thanks again for making the beautiful images yeah i'm i'm glad to be a part of it i think it's really cool and i'm really proud of you thank you so much i love you very much (laughs) i love you too